Hey guys, Julie here, and in this video, I'm going to tour you around my very first sketchbook. I got it from Walmart. It was the cheapest sketchbook that they had, and the paper was awful. I remember after this, I switched over to the Canson Mixed Media sketchbook. Oh my god, what an improvement. The paper, it felt like recycled paper that you would get worksheets on in high school. I don't know, it just was not nice paper to work with. And of course, at the time, I just started to learn how to draw, so I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> I didn't really know what was good paper or not, so I just used it and I started drawing. And how I got into drawing was, and as you could probably tell, I was obsessed with Miraculous Ladybug. Obsessed as a 20 year old. This was in 2016, I was turning 21, I was obsessed and I came across so much fan art online, of course being part of a fandom. And I so badly wanted to contribute to this fandom. But, of course, I didn't have the skills to do it. So, Miraculous Ladybug is the reason why I got into art. And since then, it's been one hell of a journey. <laughs> I've mentioned so many times already that I've spent the past two years living and working in Korea. And I wouldn't have been brave enough to make a move like that had I not fallen in love with drawing. Right now, I am 28 years old. It has been seven years since I started to learn how to draw from nothing, from nothing. <laughs> so even though that sounds like a really long amount of time, I haven't been actively trying to improve throughout those seven years. Of course, you know, life happens, things come up, your skills stagnate, you don't touch your sketchbook for a few months. So be kind with my before and after, because seven years you probably think, oh wow, you must be really good. I'm still an amateur. <laughs> I'm still very beginner. I still have a lot of work to do, but I love drawing and painting so much. It's, sometimes it's really frustrating because my skills just are not there yet, and I know that's my own fault. I have to improve, I have to practice, I have to take that time, but art is as it stands, a really big part of my identity, even though my skills are not there. So that's where I'm at right now. This first sketchbook, as you can see, I was very new <laughs> at drawing. If you looked at it, you probably wouldn't think a 20 year old was drawing all these pictures. It looks more like maybe an 11 year old. <laughs> I joined my university's drawing club I was the only beginner really at that club, so I was really shy about my drawings. But being around people who were so kind and supportive and willing to, you know, teach me, being a part of that community really kept me going. So it started off as falling in love with Miraculous Ladybug. I know, as a 20 year old, yes. <laughs> I love cartoons. <laughs> and then from there, joining the sketch club and those two combined really catapulted me into this world of art. Also, I'm sorry if my thoughts are all over the place. I normally script out what I say in most of my videos just because I articulate myself better in writing. And right now I'm just recording on the spot. I'm pausing a lot. <laughs> this is gonna be a tough one to edit <laughs> for sure. I just thought for this video it would be better suited to speak a little more candidly about this since learning how to draw impact my life in ways I, I never could have imagined it would. And this is coming from a beginner. I'm still a beginner. I know it's been seven years. I call myself an amateur artist, but I don't know. Is there a difference between the two? I don't know. So before I learned how to draw, there wasn't anything I was really good at. I always had my nose in my textbooks. I was a straight A student. That's all I had. I was good at school. <laughs> I was good at writing tests and that's it. So when it came to figuring out what I wanted to do for university, what kind of career path I wanted to follow, I put a list together, a pros and cons list, trying to think of the things I'm good at, the things I'm bad at, what I enjoy, and you know, trying to find something in between. Things I like doing and things I'm actually good at. And in this video, I have the video playing <laughs> in the background so I could like throw some comments in about it. It took me three attempts to get to the final drawing. So even to this day, 
I struggle. I struggle. And this is why I don't include the sketching portion of my drawings in my videos because first of all, with the camera there, it just adds a little bit of pressure. And honestly, I don't want you to see how <laughs> how unskilled I am when it comes to laying down that first sketch. I'm just so confused and panicked and it's just easier with the camera off but for the sake of this video since we are being candid today I thought I would show you the entire process and how frustrating it can be at times. Anyways I had this list of things I enjoy doing and on that list I had watching cartoons, riding my bike, and playing with our pet birds and <laughs> it's, you know those are those are really difficult things to plan your future around. So it was a bit of a struggle. And when it came to things I was good at, there was there was nothing. There, I <laughs> Making this list was really emotional because I realized I wasn't good at anything. I was just good at acing tests. Of course, that comes with a level of dedication and motivation, and those are really important skills to have. But what could I possibly apply them to? You know, I was really confused. So. I looked at watching cartoons and my skills, organized, motivated, determined, and together with those two, I decided I wanted to work in animation production. And I actually did. I ended up working at an animation studio that was very short-lived, but it was an admin. It was adjacent to a production assistant role. And for a long time, it was my sole focus to get to this place, working in production, and I would fantasize. Shout out to my fellow maladaptive daydreamers out there. Oh my goodness. Sometimes I would spend hours a day just imagining what my life would be. So I really tied this future career to my current identity. And, you know, obviously that's not the way to go, but... <laughs> That's what I did and I held on to it so tightly. So after graduating university, you know, I at that point I had a fair amount of work experience and customer service, admin events. Uh, I had straight A's, I had a business diploma, I had a degree in communications. I thought I was set to find a job straight away. Of course, that's not how it goes. <laughs> It took me five months to get an entry-level job at a production studio. And leading up to that, oh my god, my self-worth really took a hit. At this time, I was maybe two years into my art journey. I started to fall in love with art more and more. But the 9 to 6 working life plus an hour each way commute time took a toll. It was really difficult for me to open my sketchbook after a long work day, especially as a beginner, because art isn't something that's always relaxing. As an amateur, it is stressful at times. It takes a lot of focus. I can't just turn my brain off and draw something. I really, really have to concentrate. I'm getting to the point now where it's the line art that stresses me out and then you know when it comes to painting and coloring, I can relax and ease into it. But that initial step is not a calming place for me <laughs> and it definitely wasn't back then too when i was only two years in during my year working there i hardly touched my sketchbook and i longed so deeply for it and i was almost resentful of my love for art because i loved it so much and i was starting to discover the fact that creativity is a skill it's not something you were born with because before that it, I never saw myself as a creative person at all, at all, not even a drop of me. I always saw myself as analytical, type A, organized, not that you can't be those things and be creative too, but it really messed with my head and my sense of self. Basically, this identity that I built around this career in animation production was challenged by my love of art, reluctantly challenged. So after a year working there, I realized that I did not want to work in production. I saw the lives of the people who worked in the industry and how caught up they get in that world of production. Like if a project is delayed at all, it's the end of the world. And in my mind, I was like, there are bigger things happening. <laughs> There are bigger things happening. My point is, you you really gotta love working production to do it. You have to love it with every fiber of your being. And 
The me before learning how to draw, I think I would have. I think I would have loved that kind of life, but after discovering creativity and wanting to explore that more, my heart just wasn't in it. I have friends who are production assistants or were production assistants at the time. Now they're moving up. They're already coordinators, producers, amazing. But at the time they were production assistants working on shows and there were days where they would work 20 days straight, 12 hours a day. And the company would fund them overtime meals and also a cab ride home because sometimes they would go home at midnight or past midnight. And it really has to become your life. And I wasn't ready to give up this new hobby that I just discovered. I felt like I was just getting to know this part of myself. And if I were to dive fully into production, I would lose that. Another thing about the company I worked at, they were very much a, a we're like a family type of company. So it took a lot for me to quit. <laughs> and also it was my first job. So, you know, obviously it's like a big deal to you when it's your first job. You don't really know how everything works, how often people just come and go, how often people just leave after a month of working at a place if it doesn't suit them. So at the time, for me, leaving was a big deal. And I feel like some of my managers and supervisors made it out to be a really big deal when it wasn't. It wasn't. They just didn't want me to leave because of course that's extra admin work on their end trying to find someone new for the job. So I ended up quitting. It was very tearful. I was very guilt-ridden and I ended up traveling to South America because my dad booked a last minute trip to see family and I was like, you know what, maybe this is my ticket out. And I used that. I used that as an excuse to quit. Not that you need an excuse to quit. If you want to leave a place, you leave it. <laughs> I know that now, but at the time, I needed an excuse. I gave in my notice and I let my manager know, hey, I'm going on a trip, I have to see family, I haven't seen them in a long time, I really miss them, my dad's gonna be there, I don't know when I'll be able to go next. So I used that as an excuse, I bought my air ticket, and I flew over, I met up with my dad, we all hung out, it was in part a really nice relaxing time and it was really nice to be around my family but also i was going through this identity crisis like now what this is the one thing that i've been working towards this is the industry that i based my entire post-secondary career around now what am i gonna do with a communications degree <laughs> no shade to any of y'all who have a communications degree but woo, it is rough out here isn't it Though I think in the back of my mind, I always knew there'd be a chance that I would leave the industry. The reason why I got a degree in communications instead of something more specific like media studies or production is because I thought the more general, the better. Just in case things change, at least I have a degree that's a bit broader. It's an academic degree. It's not an arts degree. I mean, it is an arts degree, but it's not like a fine arts degree. It has more weight, generally speaking, than say a production specific education. While I was in South America, I spent a lot of time refining my art skills. And I think this is where I saw the biggest improvement in my art. I only brought a small suitcase with me, so I wasn't able to bring my markers or my bigger paints. Basically, I just had a set of watercolors and fine liners, maybe a few pencil crayons, but that's it. So this is when I really fell in love with watercolors. I really started to develop some sense of a style, which has obviously changed being five years after that point, but it was a renaissance for me and my art. Learning art in my 20s as an adult was a very humbling experience. It is incredibly, incredibly humbling to be bad at something, to be so terrible at it, but to enjoy it so much and, and to know that what you put in is what you'll get out of it. The thing about diving into something I wasn't good at and seeing those skills build over time Remove this idea that skills are ingrained into people. We pick them up and we learn and we develop them. And you can get good at something if you put the time in. 
So I know it's something so small and it seems like common sense, but think of something that you're totally not good at. It could be something as simple as jumping rope or playing chess. And in your mind, you just think, no, I'm not the kind of person who would be good at chess. And that becomes a part of your identity. And then one day you just fall into it and you're really bad at it at first. But then over time you get better and better. And it's like, oh, I guess I am the kind of person who likes chess. And then from there you wonder, oh my God, what else can I like? What else can I learn? And it just opens up your whole entire world. I don't know if that was a good example. <laughs> Maybe that was a bad example, but that's how I felt. Learning how to draw blew my world wide open because all of a sudden I was wondering, what else can I do? And that wasn't a question that I've asked myself in a long time. After I returned to Canada from South America, it was time to find a new job. <laughs> this time it took four months and I ended up working at a community center that offered classes on the arts. So dance, acting, music, pottery, painting, you name it. And this is when I fully leaned in to this desire to be in a more creative space. I was still working in admin, but being in that space, and being surrounded by so many creative people and that kind of energy really propelled me to dive into my art even more. At this point, I participated in a very amateur gallery and I sold one of my pieces. Granted, it was my supervisor who bought it, but <laughs> it still really meant a lot. It was my first sale and it was very exciting. I didn't sell it for much. It was like, what, $25 maybe? <laughs> And that basically paid for the picture frame that I put it in, but it was a really big deal to me. It was a really big moment. Working at the community center also made me fall in love with working in a public space that's publicly funded to support people in the community. I just can't imagine myself working in a for-profit company. As it stands right now, my next job will definitely be in the government and geo nonprofit space. About a year in working at the community center, I came across some kind of advertisement about working and living in Australia. This is something that sounded so incredible, but I didn't see myself as the kind of person who could just drop everything and move to a different country. And then I unpacked that a little and I wondered why? Why can't I be that kind of person? I thought I'd be working in production in the private sector. Now I'm working at a community center. <laughs> now I'm fully diving into my art. Now I want to pursue the kind of work that helps people in some way. So why can't I be the kind of person who just buys a plane ticket and lives somewhere else? And then I realized the reason why I never envisioned my life outside of Canada or North America is because in the back of my mind, there was still this idea that I wanted so desperately to work in production and being a native English speaker, I mean, the place to be if you're in Canada is either Vancouver or Toronto, and I'm already in Vancouver or somewhere down in the States. So in my mind, I always just envisioned my future here. Now that that wasn't my career trajectory, now that I was slowly becoming open to trying new things and figuring out my new identity, <laughs> I thought, why the heck not? So I called up my best friend and I was like, hey, do you want to work in Australia? Let's pick up some working holiday visas. It'll be fun. And she was so down for it. And we were looking into it. We were planning our date. And then of course, COVID hit. No one was allowed in Australia. We were stuck. My job became null and void. And it was the first time where I really started to resent that job because the nature of it completely changed. And there was also this looming fear of, oh my God, am I gonna lose my job? Because right now, as it stands in my position, I'm not needed. <laughs> and I did end up getting laid off temporarily, and then they hired me back on 
but it was a really stressful time and I really started to dislike the kind of job that I was doing, which went from 20-30% admin and then the rest interacting with people to 100% admin. It was a huge difference. At this point, I made the decision that I needed to go. I needed to go somewhere. I would take anywhere, as long as it was safe, as long as I was able to secure a job and a place to live, I needed to go. And that's when I decided to go to South Korea. So I ended up staying there for two years and I posted a video recently about my experience there. As I was flipping through my very first sketchbook a few days ago, I just saw all of the dots connect. I wouldn't have had the experience of moving to South Korea if it wasn't for art, and that was pivotal in building me up as a person. I wouldn't have discovered that I wanted to work in a community-based job. I wouldn't have started to dream about this life where I can pursue art on the side, even if just as a hobby or making videos for fun. I wouldn't be open to meeting new people and trying new things. So overall, learning how to draw was so much more than putting pencil to paper. It revolutionized my life. It led me to places I never thought I would have gone and it's made me overall a better person. Just being more open to trying new things, being more open to talking to people, hearing their stories. As you can see, the art in this video is not perfect, but I have come a long way and for that I'm very proud. It took a few tries to get the sketch right, but once I got it, I feel like I got the ball rolling pretty well. There are parts of this drawing that I could pick apart, but you know, today I'm just not going to. I'm really proud of how far I've come, not only in my abilities to draw, but in me as a person and i really hope that if you are just starting to learn how to draw yourself that you really fall in love with it i hope that you enjoy the journey of it all and know that i'll be here cheering you on along the way because my god <laughs> what an adventure so have fun go easy on yourself don't expect to improve overnight. It takes time, in my case, years. <laughs> and if you're down on yourself or your art, just know that if it's something you love, you'll get there. Don't put a time limit on it if you don't have to. Just enjoy the ride and enjoy where it takes you. Be open to all of it. I have kept every single one of my old sketchbooks, my old drawings, even though I can look at it and say that, oh, this is not good. All of it has a soft spot in my heart because it just represents so much more than a drawing. Oh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> it takes a lot to pull yourself out of the box that you put yourself in after so many years. But identities are fluid and your personality traits are fluid and you don't have to stay there in that place. If you want to reinvent yourself, you can. Even though right now I'm not working and I'm casually looking for a job, to people on the outside it might seem like I'm more lost than I've been in the past, but I've never had as much clarity in my life and my trajectory as I do now. Even though I don't know where it'll lead me, I'm okay with that. I have a better idea of what I like, what I don't like, and what I want to contribute to the world. And right now, for me, that's more than enough. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Good luck to you out there if you're a beginner artist or if you've been drawing for two decades. I hope you're having a good time, and I hope that your art is taking you to some incredible places, both metaphorically and physically. Best of luck, and as always, stay creative. Bye!